Hello and welcome to the Little Knowledge Podcast for a little bonus edition. Um, what did you call it? A posy of pencarns. A posy of pencarniana. That's it. That was a posy of pencarniana. Pencarniana. I don't get yeah. out much. <laughs> Goff Morgan, who doesn't get out much. <laughs> and uh, Greetings, Joe. And I'm Paul Busby. Thank you for joining us um, again. Yep. If it's your first time, uh, do try and click on some of the other videos as well. Sometimes they're usually longer form delves into grand properties. This is a bit of a ghost property, this, because there's so little known about it. Even the fact that was there a house there at all? It probably was. Hmm. Um, but it'll I'll make it clear as we as we go on. How are you, Goff, anyway? Are you OK? Yeah, bumbling along, bumbling along. Various domestic crises, as usual, including a spectacularly collapsing bed frame. Dude, it went down like a house of cards. As soon as I can describe it, as I, but I remember, you know, it was leaning a bit, and you go like, mm, "Must do something about this." Oh, I'll pop around here. So I sat cautiously around the head in front of the dressing table. I'm that old; I still have a dressing table, and I sat there in front of the mirror, and the whole thing just went down underneath me like a descending escalator. It was <laughs> frightening, frightening. So. As I managed to haul my uh, antipose body off the uh, off the thing, so I'm trying to sort that out now. That's pretty horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so I said I'm, I'm sort of nesting in this sort of mattress on the top of sort of a loose combination of sticks and fabric and the occasional boinging spring at the moment. <laughs> oh dear! So yeah, it's nothing uh... to do with Pen Khan, by the way. I just want to slot it in, keep you interested. <laughs> yeah, nothing to do with Pen Khan. In fact, I'm trying to find a link for our first little bit because we've got a little bit of news, first of all. Oh, I know. I've got the perfect link. From okay. Goff Morgan to another man who broke a lot of beds in his time, no doubt. Um, Evan Morgan, uh, Lord Tredega, who we talked about on our uh, part four of our Morgan trilogy. Um, a portrait has been found of him recently. And it's a portrait that um, I, I know that Sir Michael Holroyd uh, didn't know where it was. Uh, Augustus John's biographer back in the 90s and... I have no idea where it was. It was clearly in a private collection while it came up for auction. Oh, right. So uh, the lost Augustus John, as I thought it was, wasn't lost at all. It just wasn't, uh, you know. Oh, so wasn't... it's an Augustus John painting. Yeah, it's an Augustus oh. John painting. And it oh. sold at auction, was it last week at Christie's okay. for, um, they thought they'd get eight grand for it, but it went for about 17 grand. Oh, good Lord. And there it is. Oh, gosh, oh, he's quite young there. Not now, this is the thing. Yeah, he is, isn't he? Yeah. Now, they said the date on this was 1925, but this looks far more like 1915, Evan. Yes, it does. Yeah, from the pictures we've seen of him. Yeah, I wouldn't say that was 25. So unless it took Augustus John 10 years to complete this. <laughs> yeah, quite, yeah. I've yeah. got a feeling that oh, it really looks like 1915. Yeah. Right down to the fluff that he had in 1915 on his top lip. Yes, yes. <laughs> so maybe I read it wrong. Maybe it was printed That's wrong. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, but that well, looks. Like... The first time, when you, they, what they tend to do is that well, if we look at it, you can see that very flushed, reddish complexion of his. As mm. most the, most portraits you see of him, or pick, they tend to leave that out. But um, uh, but obviously, Justice John has actually tucked that in because he's referred to by uh, who's it refers to him as a strutting red absurdity. Oh, but Virginia Woolf said called him uh, the most obvious was Evan Morgan. Um, yes, a little red absurdity. Yeah. The beak of a nose, no chin, and with the general likeness to a callow but student bantam cock that has run to legs and neck. Yeah, yeah, you, it's funny, you can actually see what she meant by that picture, though, can't you? Yeah, but isn't it great that uh, you know that another Augustus John has been found, another portrait of Evan Morgan, which is which is yeah. very nice. And also, what's similar as well is if you go to Street House today, you see a port and a portrait of um, Catherine Carnegie Evans' mother by Augustus John. So he must have done it perhaps around a similar time. Oh yeah, John was close to both. Uh, Mother and son, yeah. Uh, and in fact, the place we're talking about is just south of Evan Morgan's ancestral home, of course, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. So why are we talking about Pen Khan specifically? Because Pen Khan has been sprinkled like confetti or icing on the top of several of our videos. Yes. Um, but it's never actually been curated. If you want, if you're interested in Pen Khan, you'd have to go through four other videos trying to find a sentence here and there. Yeah. And a very good uh, friend of the channel, Chris Williams, who is a subscriber and a long term encourager. Yes. 
Um, I think he lives Pen Khan, and he did ask in one of the comments, could you do a little bit on Pen Khan? So I thought, well, a little bonus where if you want to know about Pen Khan, it's all in one place. Seemed like a good idea. So that's why we're doing it. Nice. So you can see Tradiga House there. Yeah. And we'll go south. And here you can see Pen Khan. Middle Pen Khan. In little, otherwise known as Little Pen Khan. Yeah. Middle Pen Khan. And if you go all the way down here, Great Pen Khan. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, there we are. Yeah. So interesting. I knew that. Now, as they look today, let me get this up. So you've got the various Pen Khans here. Yeah. And you can see that Newport and the advance of Newport has been quite merciless. The little Pen Khan's gone. Oh, yeah. Middle Pen Khan's gone. Yeah. It is gone. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, Great Pen Khan, uh, it was still here. Until about 2007. Oh, right. Ooh, gravel pit. Where are we? Oh, I'm in the wrong place there. You're a great pen, Carl. There we are. It was here until, on this spot, until 2007, but that's gone now as well. Oh, gosh. So all the pen cons are either under a housing estate, knocked down, or eventually knocked down quite recently. Oh. Uh, we're at the south of Imperial Park. That's where yeah. we are now, if you know the area. Um, it's a shame, really. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how things just disappear. But Pen Khan is a place which is sort of mentioned. It goes way back. And it, it, like I said, it has little mentions here and there. And we have to start with, uh, with St. Gladys. Oh, yes. So now Gladys is connected to this spot. So wait, let's find her. There she is, St. Gladys, who ha we have mentioned, as I've said um, before on this spot. Uh, now, Gladys was around in the 5th century, second half of the 5th century, Gladys. Yeah. And she was a daughter of King Brecon, where we get the name Brecon. Yeah. He came well, from Ireland. There were 25 daughters of King Brecon. Yep, uh, according or, to some sources. Or up to 60, according to more ambitious sources, who were there to expound upon his... Legendary fecundity. That's the best way <laughs> to describe it. Well, well, this is it. And you do get more sensational sources. The sources for what I'm, we're going to talk about, Gladys, came from two volumes, Lives of the Saints, The Life of Gwyntlug, Wallace, who Gladys ultimately married, and that's written in 1120, and The Life of St. Caddoc, their son, yeah. which was written at uh, Lancarvan in 1086. Oh. So you know, they're pretty old sources, and that 1086, so this is before Geoffrey of Monmouth and all of this, which makes it quite interesting, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Gladys was the beautiful daughter of King Brucken, and the um, the slightly more rough and tumble uh, sort of petty king of this area, uh, Gwyntlug, Gwyntlug the Bearded, he is sometimes known. Huh? Gwyntlug the Bearded. Are you looking with pride there? I do. Yeah, I, I'm a proud bearded descendant of Gwyntlug, obviously. But there is some stained glass of St. Gwyntlug, and he's utterly clean-shaven, so obviously they didn't read that <laughs> volume. Uh, anyway, he really loves... And then Gwyntlug is really... Gwyntlug, as a man, left a lot to be desired. Um, it was said he was very partial to thieves, Gwyntlug. <laughs> and he was also something, to put a sort of American terminology on it, a cattle rustler. Oh, yeah, yeah. He loves stealing other people's cows and getting in lots of scraps. I mean, you had to be tough, didn't you, to be a, a petty king in uh, in this area, a chieftain I mean, at the time? King, I think, is slightly gilding the lily there. I mean, you're really looking at a warlord. These were post yeah. Roman warlords who yeah. dominated the area by by acting like gangland bosses, basically. Um, so king, I think, is really stretching the title rather. It is, but he's called. He's he's sometimes called that. You're right. It's stretching it, but they but usually with the word petty near to it, so you know that mm. it's like being king of your street in, in some ways. <laughs> king of the close. Again, you got King Bracken as well, and you know that. So they are bandying around this king title at this point in these book in these uh, volumes. So anyway, he wants to marry Gladys, who appears to want nothing of it. You know this this rough and ready. So his plan is to kidnap her. With 300 knights. Again, that might be Guild in the Lily as well. Yeah. 300 knights oh, could be people on the horses that they knights. may have stolen. Knights? Really? Oh, <laughs> followers, I would have thought. 300 blokes with a rock on a string. That would be <laughs> Nevertheless, according to this, 
<laughs> they got hold of Gladius and kidnapped. Now, the kidnapping of princesses is not as unusual as you would think in Lives of Saints. No. There is a motif going on here. Bit of and, uh, syndrome he's going for on this one, isn't it? <laughs> well, well, this is true. Yeah, and it seems to have worked. Um, they, they, they did run away with her, and King Brucken gave chase. And 200 of his uh, men, of the 300, died. Um, so, uh, in fact, King Arthur appears at this point. Remember, this is before Geoffrey of Monmouth. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is one of the earliest mentions of Arthur. Oh. It's in this 1086 life of St. Caddock. And Arthur uh, basically uh, stops King Brucken sort of catching up with the... Uh, you would like to say in love couple, but we don't know how in love Gladys was. It appears to be slightly involuntary at this point, doesn't it? Um, but even Arthur falls under Gladys's spell, it was said. And after a while, after rescuing her, it was said that Arthur thought that he might want to keep her for himself. <sighs> We're not talking about the, our very knightly Arthur in these stories. Yeah, this is this is yeah, this is before <laughs> Geoffrey of Monmouth. This is this is Arthur. It is that Arthur. Because two men who were with him, Sir Bedivere and Sir Kay, basically convince him to, you know, let Gladys go. Yeah. Arthur, you don't really want to, do you? There's more princesses in the sea, Arthur. There's more princesses. <laughs> more princesses in the sea. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, and so they do get married and they do have these children, including St. Caddock. And uh, they are still rough and ready, it has to be said. They're still doing the old cattle rustling. They're still doing crimes. They're still... To the embarrassment of their son. Oh, yes. <laughs> Caddock is utterly embarrassed by this. And he basically tells them at one point to just stop it. <laughs> Mum and Dad, stop being awful. So they do this for a bit. And then, fortunately, they find, they find God. And Gwynt Lug founds his church on Stowe Hill. Yeah. And they decide to become hermits. And becoming well, they... hermits and, and living a more um, abstinent life. Yeah. It still wasn't good enough, so Caddock suggests a separation. And it's at yeah. that point that Gladys finds her Mount of Solitude, and it's vaguely something from Superman, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which was Pen Khan. Oh. So Is Gladys it... goes to Pen Khan. I haven't ever thought that Pen Khan was particularly hilly. I don't know. Mm. Uh, but she goes there and she founds a, a hermitage there and a chapel there, so it's said. Yeah. Um, she has a holy well. The well bubbles up and we've looked yeah. for the holy well and we know where the holy well is. We'll have a little look at that uh, towards the uh, in a little while. Okay. But yes, there is Gladys. And that's why you've got the because, you know, you know, of course, Goff, tell us why there would be an oxen here with St. Oh, Gwidlug. Part of the legend of the foundation of St. Woolus Cathedral is that uh, they were told, I think it was yeah, they told that where you see a white ox grazing, there you must build a chapel. So the oldest chapel, as you know, part of St. Woolus Cathedral in Newport. Um, was built on the site of where they saw a white ox grazing. So that's why the, the white ox is in the background there with a little cross above it, the, the cross above it. And this is where we have separate sources now, because one source says that Gladys dies at Pencarn. It says oh. Gladys dies at Pencarn and is buried there. And that is certainly what Lord Tredegar believed. And here we have by the artist Green, and this is from the Newport, the excellent Newport Past website that has brought together some of Green's late 19th century sketches. This is the supposed grave in Tredega Park of St. Gladys. You don't think that is the mound that they're talking about? The it is the mound they're talking about, yeah. The mound of solitude? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That interesting. Uh, it <laughs> might be. Seems an interesting. It's clearly not the grave of Gladys because it's huge, so it's it's a it's a, a bump in the ground that's been attached to her, I would reckon. But it's that's fascinating. Oh, is that supposed to be the grave of Saint Gladys? Yes, and Godfrey Lord Tredegar, around about this time, was taking around um, a group from of historians from Cardiff, and he actually pointed that out quite proudly. He said I quite like the idea of having the grave of a saint. On my ground, and even though some historians will say, "Oh, it isn't so," and could point out other, other possible sites, uh, Godfrey said, "Well, I have as much claim to it as them, really." When you look at how much evidence <laughs> yeah. survives, so did Lord Tredegar essentially in his rather spacious back garden have the grave of a saint? How 
was that's, that's very intriguing, that isn't it? I, I, that's a I've never seen this picture before. That's fascinating. She's certainly tied to the area, isn't she? Well, and, and it also ties to that concept of the mound of of solitude. Of solitude yeah, yeah. Solitude. I didn't think of it that way. That's a very, but very good point. The, uh, hermitage was around that site somewhere, and that's how it's been. And now it's been considered a great. Whenever you saw a bump in the ground at some point in the nineteenth century, they thought they were burial mounds, even though often they weren't. Whatever they were, we don't know. Yeah, the Catholic Church in Newport is the St Basil and St Gladys, and indeed some people have pointed to Baslig as a place which is named after Basilica. Basilica, of course, being the resting place of a saint. Oh, wrong! Well, that's very interesting. I never knew that. So it's, it's another theory, you know. I wouldn't hang your hat on it, but it's uh, you can't hang your hat on anything when you go this far back, really, can you? It's complicated. Very, yeah, very, very murky murky area to dig around in uh oh by the way there the other version is uh, uh gladys is claimed by gethley gear who claim that uh one of the sources does indeed say that gladys in later life rather than died at pen Carn, she did set up a chapel at pen Carn, but she then moved to gethley gear and that's where she died and there is a st gladys church at gethley gear oh right oh right okay so they've certainly embraced gladys these days far more than this area, really. Uh, and there was, of course, some would say that near the uh, Holy Well of St. Gladys, was there was a chapel of St. Gladys. Oh, right. And here it is. Oh, it was Edward, near Newport Mall. Oh, right. Still there in the 1890s, and it was converted into housing. Oh. It became Rock Cottages, it was called. What cottages? Rock. Rock. Yep. Because it's very rocky ground there on that part of the bank of the Ebu. Oh, rocky. Which, incidentally, is where sources say Gladys had the holy well. Yeah. yeah. On the rocky bank of the river Ebu. Oh, right. So there we are. And in fact... So is that gone as well, I presume? Uh, there is. I think there is part of the building still there, but it's oh. now housing. Oh, right. Oh, oh, a little bit there, I think. I haven't been there, It's. It's. it's but um, I believe so. Speaking of having a look, if we go back to our plan here, you'll notice that it should still be, if we go back to Tradiga Park, oh gosh, I've gone past it, haven't I? Tradiga Park, Tradiga Park. Yeah, down a bit. Yeah. yeah. No, you don't, you don't. No, go south. No, I know. I found it. I'm looking for something else. Oh, I see. Uh, uh. Around Tradiga Park. Hang on. Ah, yes, it is still there. I did mark it. I'm not going insane. This is where Gladys's holy well was. Or the ladies' well. Oh, so it's there. up there on the banks of the rocky bit of the river Ebu. And if we move uh, if we move in with the photo... I know we've mentioned this before. Yeah. If you're in the car park of Tradiga Park, as opposed to Tradiga oh, yes, Park House, yeah. you look across the Ebu, and there, the there is where it was. And indeed... Um, it's very it's hard to be accessible, but a lady on YouTube all along, a lady called Evelyn Nicholson, actually did a bit of research a few years ago and asked the owners of the housing nearby if she could have a look at the Holy Well, at Gladys's well, to see what was left of it. Oh yeah. And she very kindly put it on YouTube. Oh gosh. Here it oh, is. Right. So it's still oh, it is still there then. And look how fast it flows. Lady well, I think. Gladys's lady well, yeah. Look how fast it flows. Yeah. Oh, well, well. When Evelyn did this interview, um, a, the lady who lived there, lived there for 80 years, and it was her parents' house as well, and it had never dried up. Oh, gosh. So, of course, they've added this boundary here, and they've added yeah. your black plastic bags and things like that, but it's always, even, she said, in 1976, the great drought, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this was still happily flowing. So Gladys's holy well is still doing its thing. Yeah. Oh, well, well. Hopefully nobody bathes naked in it now. Well, mind you, if it's on private ground, why not? Indeed. That's what Gladys used to do. Covered owners feel like a quick dip it's up to them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, blood, blood. And now Gladys's well has gnomes guarding it, and why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, how interesting. Ah, so well, that's a, a, an interesting little bit, isn't it? So Gladys, that was uh, Gladys. Now a bit more um, 
bloodthirsty now. Goff, you have an honorary nephew, don't you? I have a what? An honorary nephew. Indeed, yes. Yes, I am my adopted nephew, Hogan. I am an uncle, and I have been afraid of this for some time. Sometimes when I look at the gleam in their eyes, I feel that one day this might happen to me, especially the two-year-old. Because <laughs> in 1174, living at Pencarn was a man called Owain Pencarn, who was the son of the Lord of Kalian. So there's clearly a residence on Pencarn at that time, at least. Yeah. Um, and his nephew, Howell Ap Yorath, treated his uncle with far from a vuncular respect. Yeah. He imprisoned him at Kalian, castrated him and put his eyes out. <laughs> so I do fear the worst. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, hmm. Rough time. I haven't given him his Christmas present yet. Uh, just wait. Yeah, wait. I'm looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the point is, in 1174, then, uh, Pencarn was seen clearly as important enough to be the, you know, the seat of the son of the Lord of Kalian. Mm, yeah. And people are living there at that time. Um, yeah. yeah, it's intriguing, that one, isn't it? And indeed, royalty touches the area as well. Uh, this is Gerald of Wales. Ah. You know, who was a sort of clerk to a king and I think two archbishops, yeah. Gerald of Wales. And when he was on a preach, I don't know what you think of prophecy, Goff. Have you got any time for Mr. Nostradamus and all of that sort of thing? Nah. No, me neither. Nah. But Gerald did. Gerald oh. did. And in the 11, uh, what was it, 1150s, possibly, maybe 1160s, uh, Gerald was preaching in North Wales on a preaching tour. And in North Wales, he actually found the prophecies of Merlin. So again, it's all terribly Arthurian, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This is the yeah, yeah. Even two two stories now we touched on on Arthur and, and Arthuriana. Yeah, amazing. Now Gerald believed actually Merlin was two people, Merlin Ambrosius and Merlin Sylvestre, and these were the prophecies of Merlin Sylvestre who lived at the time of Arthur. Don't know what happened to the Ambrosius uh, a chap. I'll, we'll have to look into that. Anyway, there was a prophecy, and the prophecy said this: where Whenever you shall see a mighty prince with a freckled face make a hostile eruption in the southern part of Britain, should he cross the ford of Pencarn, yeah. freed Pencarn, at the stream Nant Pencarn, then know ye that the forces of Cambria shall be brought low. So Nant Pencarn, somewhere around Pencarn is a stream. Yeah. If they go across the... Uh, slightly boggy old ford, then Cambria will fall. Well, King Henry II found himself in the area yeah. during his war with the Lord Rees. And he'd heard of this. He'd heard of prophecies. Usually he rubbished them. Yeah. If uh, Henry II heard that Merlin had said anything, he'd deliberately do it and then say, there you go, Merlin's a liar. <laughs> really tempted fate, did Henry II. <laughs> anyway, he found himself in this part of the world. Yeah. And he was going to cross, which some people actually think was probably Nant Pen Khan was probably the River Ebu. Oh, right. Ah, oh, right, yeah. So he was looking for a ford over. And there was a newer ford rather than the old Harid Pen Khan, Reed Pen Khan. And uh, as he was about to cross it, the people on the other side of the bank cheered and spooked his horse. And the horse turned, but they actually went over the old ford of Pen Khan. Oh, yeah. And when he on his horse crossed that, all the Welsh people, onlookers, held, hung their heads, knowing what that meant. Oh, that Merlin's yeah. prophecy of the fall of Cambria would come to fruition. Oh, that's interesting. Nant Pen Khan. Yeah. So we can't be sure exactly. I mean, we know it's this area, yeah. but we can't be sure. Green was pretty sure that it was here. So there you are, River Ebu. Yep. Going over. It wasn't the depth, apparently. It was the bogginess. Made yeah. it difficult to get over that part of the ford. It, it, it was a very, very boggy area where we're, that we're talking about today. Um, it, yeah, it, it's actually so, so most a lot of it is below sea level for a start. Um, so there's the sea wall is what's reclaimed land, which is done right back even in the Roman period. So it, it, it is a boggy territory. Yeah. So that's there's a lot to be accurate about the area, if nothing else. They've got the fact that the bogginess of it. I mean, it may be, though, we end up, it's not, we're not far from a place called Marshfields. But, yeah, yeah. That which is drained continually by reams. Yeah. And the landscape has altered um, since then. 
Yeah. Um, so we, we don't know. What I love about Penn Con is there's so much to consider and talk about. I remember being in a pub once with uh, our mate uh, Stefan. And Stefan was is interested in all this. And we talked about Nant Pen Khan, you know, the Pen Khan stream, and where was it? And what was this body of water, which wasn't deep, but it could be a bit boggy if you crossed it. And it's amazing when you have little ideas. Stefan thought, um, what if it was all part of the spring underneath Tradiga House? And what the Morgans had actually done to harness the prophecies of Merlin. Yeah, yeah. And that old legend actually literally build their ancestral home on top of this thing. Oh, as if as if to say we are laying claim <laughs> to be in the sort of the monarchs of the area. Yeah. Uh, it's unlikely, but there are all kinds of little theories about it. It probably was the River Ebu and it probably was this little bit here. Yeah. But again, another legend which uh, again touches on Arthur. Yeah. But to get back to again, we leave Henry the Second and we're in thirteen fifteen now. Now, uh, Sir Morgan at Meredith, Morgan the Rebel, he was around at that time, uh, and he died. And his great enemy, you might remember, was Gilbert de Clare, of, who built Caffilly Castle. Yeah. We're never a fan of Gilbert de Clare. Well, he was the man who invented the eclair, let's be fair. <laughs> now, de Clare, not Gilbert de Clare. <laughs> if he was the man who invented the eclair, he'd be a lot more popular. Yeah. <laughs> but when he died... Uh, he had an in, in 1315, there was an inquisito post mortem of Gilbert de Clare, and it says this Pen Khan, a tenement sometime of the Templars for life by William de Rosalis. Oh, interesting. So Pen Khan, sometime after the eye gouging incident, yeah. um, ended up in the hands of the Templars. Oh, that's very interesting. And they didn't have all that many. Properties in Wales. So it's yeah. interesting. I don't know why they ended up with Penn Khan. What was the name of it? What did you say the place was called? The place? But they, but they, what did they call the association with the Templars? It was a something of the Templars? A tenement. A tenement. Well, that's a living area. That's a sort of barracky type area for the Templars, then, isn't that? Tenement, sometime of the Templars, and then for life by William de Rosilis. Well, that's interesting. So now the Templars, of course. Uh, Tell us quickly, Goff, who the Templars were for people that might not know. The Templars were essentially a group of warrior monks. They they were warriors who lived under a sort of monkly order uh, and, and, and monastic type life, which was set up for them by like St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, they were based, essentially, their purpose was to defend the pilgrimage routes to the Holy Land um, and Jerusalem. Uh, through the Holy Land in Jerusalem, that's what they claimed to be about. They were a pan-European organisation. They had various places called preceptories. And it basically one of the things you could actually do if you wanted to sort of get in favour with them is you left them your land and you left them properties and stuff. So they became one of the most fantastically rich organisations pan-European over, the, over those uh, following centuries. Everything, there were all these various little places around the country and, and you, where they would just literally funnel money out to uh, Jerusalem and the place where they were ba they, their base in Jerusalem, which was the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Um, okay. So you could literally go, you know, to pay in some money in this country, get all the way across to Jerusalem and draw the money out there. So they were, almost became a very early form of banking as well. So they were, yeah, very, very aus sort of austere life. They never washed, they never bathed, they never shaved. But they ended up in all the major principal courts of Europe, these stinking, stinking, hairy creatures. Um, and they were the very, they, they employed organized battle tactics, which was still, it was still much, much skirmishing at the time. They involved in a, yeah, a great deal of, of the defense of the Holy Land, as it was seen. Mm -hmm. so I think it's fascinating. By King Philip the Fair of France, who yep. basically wanted all their money. On Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. I'd say it's a bad day. It was organised across the whole of Europe. And they obviously do the usual charges of heresy, which apply to everybody. Um, but the fascinating thing is the Templar fleet got tipped off and it sailed away. <laughs> <laughs> and they never got their hands on the money at all, which is the whole purpose of them trying to get it. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, it's great that we've got we've had kings, legendary and historical, yeah. and uh, the Knights Templar. 
on this little sp scrap of land we saw, which is pretty much unloved at the moment, is wasteland, I mean, isn't it? They were. I mean, there was a Templar preceptory in Bridge End, I believe. I think I remember somebody telling me at one point. So, mm. yeah, they've been, yeah, they did. They weren't so densely populated. Yeah, we were the fringes of, of sort of their territory, really. Yeah. Well, that's well. They had Pencarn for a while. We know that. Well, and then uh, the Flemings took over. The Fleming family, they were at Pencarn, and the last uh, of the Flemings, Elizabeth, married John Morgan, who was a descendant of the Morgans of Pencoid, who were themselves the descendants of the Morgans of Tredegar, who really are their neighbours at this point, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right next door to Tredegar House, as you saw on the, oh, yes. on the map. Just flip down the road, and there they are. Um, yeah, oh, yes. Um, when we did our video on Tlantanam Abbey... Yes. Uh, one lady said in the comments, um, what about the Stuart stuff? And I think I mentioned this to you, Goth. And I said, well, I'm not sure what you mean by the Stuart stuff. I think I now know what she meant. Um, Thomas Morgan, the conspirator. Now, according to Wikipedia and various sources, Thomas Morgan, the conspirator, was born at Lantanum. The problem I have with that is you can't find him on the family tree anywhere. He doesn't fit. Clark has had a go. Uh, lots of people have had a go. You cannot cram him into the Morgans of Flantarnum. The fact that he was Catholic is possibly why they thought Morgan's Catholic, Lantarnum Morgans of the Catholics will stick him in there. Yeah. Um, now, I think he was probably of the Baselig Morgans, Thomas Morgan the Conspirator. But John Cole Fletcher, who had uh, a book sell in an antiques business on, uh, in Bridge Street, in Newport, and he died in the 40s. He was an extremely good historian, especially with family history, delved through all sorts of papers, gave a talk in Newport, putting Thomas Morgan, the conspirator, as being from Penn Calm. Oh, oh. So I thought this is as good a place as any to at least give him a mention. Yeah. And Thomas Morgan, the conspirator, um, uh, he, was, he, he was never going to turn out straight lace with that name, was he? No, no, right, no. Uh, he was very well educated, and uh, the Earl of... Um, Shrewsbury and also I think the Earl of Pembroke sort of patronised him and he ended up at a house called Tutbury and there the son being held prisoner at Tutbury that he fell hopelessly devoted to and it was this woman Mary Queen of Scots Oh blimey <laughs> So Thomas basically becomes her secretary Thomas Morgan and he, and he would smuggle out her secret letters and he'd do all this, utterly devoted to Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, he was imprisoned in the Tower of London in 1572, after one of the conspiracies was uh, sort of appeared to have been uh, unveiled. They said he was involved in the Rodolphi plot to blow up Rodolphi, you see, one of the enemies of Mary, Queen of... Uh, uh, one of the enemies there. So he was basically to kill him, and he was uh, involved in it, apparently. So he was thrown in the Tower in 1572, so he went to Paris and he carried on managing Mary's correspondence, smuggling, mm. and a libel was produced called Leicester's Commonwealth, really having a poke at all of Elizabeth I's Protestant advisers. Oh, yeah. Leicester being the chief of which. And Walsingham was convinced this was written by Thomas Morgan. Oh, right. So Walsingham hates Thomas Morgan at this point, yeah. absolutely loathes him. Uh, he gets thrown in the Bastille. So he's been in the Tower of London, yeah. and he's been thrown in the Bastille, but he was still plotting, and he was involved heavily in the Babington plot of 1586 to kill Queen Elizabeth I. Oh, blimey! You're so all those letters and... Conspirator here, aren't you? You're not he, he is the best level. conspirator. Yeah, yeah, good lord. Walsingham saw the codes, and he thought, and he said, these codes smack of Morgan, really. <laughs> it's got to be him. And, of course, the Babington plot was, of course, the plot that ultimately saw the death of Mary, Queen of Scots. Yeah. Um, but by this time, Morgan's in Europe, and he's not coming back anytime soon. Yeah. Um, he was arrested again. The Pope commanded his release. He was in the Spanish Netherlands. He was in prison for three years there, for more conspiring. And uh, he got close to Mary's son, James VI. Oh, you see, yeah. but even when James the Sixth took the throne and became uh, James the Sixth and James the First of England, um, he didn't come home. He carried on plotting. 
<laughs> in Europe, and he sort of disappears in 1605, and you never hear from him again. I like to think somewhere Thomas Morgan the conspirator is still plotting. <laughs> <laughs> so he might be from Baselig. He probably isn't from Lantarnum. He might be from Pencarn, if John Kill uh, Fletcher is to be believed. Oh, uh, gosh, interesting. Yeah. So the Morgans have settled there now at Pencarn, in whatever manor house, if there was one. Mm. Um, and we have the Warriors. If they're a fighting branch, the Morgans of Pencarn from here on in. Oh, right. Um, Sir Thomas Morgan, we're talking about the 1550s, 1560s, 1570s. He goes off to become a, a captain in the Netherlands. And what's happening is it's the Spanish Netherlands, Catholic, and the Dutch are rising up against it. Right. And so the, 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 the English are sending troops over there to help the Dutch. So this, these Morgans are now very Protestant, you would have thought, because Thomas, um, uh, Sir Thomas Morgan uh, goes over there as a captain in the Netherlands, basically teaching them muskets. And a lot of the volunteers over there were Welsh. Oh, God, there were men that he knew and he trained them and he was involved um, in all kinds of... Uh, in fact, one military uh, regiment, basically, its foundation, they stem from Sir Thomas Morgan oh, and God. those volunteers that went there. The Buffs. Have you heard of the Buffs, Goff? The 3rd yeah. Regiment of Foot. Oh, yeah. That basically came from Sir Thomas Morgan's volunteers oh, uh, in uh, the Spanish Netherlands. And that's why, as part of their sort of symbol, the buffs, uh, is the griffin of the Morgans. Oh, right, well, well, that's interesting. I never knew that. Thomas was also involved in a few battles, lots of battles he fought in Sir Thomas Morgan, including the siege in 1588 of Bergen op Zoom. Siege of Bergen op Zoom. <laughs> Sir Thomas, it's in the sort of southeast, I think, of the Netherlands. Yeah. And there's a great, I love this uh, painting of the siege of Bergen op Zoom involved with the Duke of Parma, because here he is. But uh, the tactics appear to be just grab his head and pull. Yeah. <laughs> he does have an enormous spear in him as well. But he's little oh, yeah. Yeah. But the head pulling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this looks like a man who really knows he's made the wrong choice in life. <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> Bergen op Zoom. Bergen op Zoom. In fact, he becomes the governor of Bergen op Zoom. So this Sir Thomas Morgan becomes a really important military figure. Really important military figure, Sir Thomas Morgan of Pencarn. He lives to a good age and he has gilt armour. Oh, oh, Artist's well, impression of the gilt armour of Sir Thomas Morgan of Pencarn. That, that's an impression, is it? Oh, it uh, certainly is. Yes, it's not true <laughs> to life. <laughs> You have to look at the subtle uh, differences to the history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think he was ever that shiny. I don't think he wore that at the defence of Delft. No, quite no. 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 <laughs> but he lives a lot in, in uh, the Netherlands. So we have got this Dutch connection yeah. right on the doorstep of Tredegar House. Yes. Which yes. in latter years is built in a very Dutch style. Yeah. Oh, no, that's interesting. Because this is, what, uh, two centuries before? Well, this is Sir Thomas Morgan died in 1595. Was that less than, only about 115. In yeah. fact, it's even closer because his nephews, who didn't attack him and, uh, and, and castrate yeah. him and poke at his eyes, they treated an uncle as an uncle should be treated. Um, uncle Sir Thomas Morgan passed on his gilt armour to his nephew Sir Matthew Morgan. And Sir Matthew Morgan was also a warrior. He was close to the Earl of Essex. He was MP for Brecon, one of those early Morgan MPs for yeah. Brecon. They always were from that moment on, weren't they? Yeah, they locked the assholes, don't they? Yeah. He inherited the gilt armour, and he was a, very much a warrior as well. And uh, But he, he lost a lot of money. He was £1,500 in debt and utterly penniless by 1602, Sir Matthew. And he sort of disappears impoverished at that time. One thing is interesting, Sir Matthew did pay money each year to Lucy Morgan, who was one of Queen Elizabeth I's ladies of the bedchamber, so we assume they were probably related. Oh, yeah. So the Morgans of Pencarn might have had a lady in the court of Elizabeth I. And not just any lady, it's a lady that some people suggest that Shakespeare was in love with and may well have based the dark lady on Lucy Morgan. 
The evidence isn't much about that, but some people have suggested it. I've certain I've heard suggestions that the dark lady is in fact a dark man. Before. Oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Southampton and all kinds of different uh, suggestions. Yeah. Um, so Sir Matthew was there, and Sir Matthew's younger brother, Sir Charles Morgan. They've all got knighthoods. He continues the warrior um, theme, and uh, he fights for the King of Denmark. He's at the defense of Breda, and he is in the Netherlands. More Dutch influence. Yeah. And not just more Dutch influence, uh, he's actually the governor of Bergen op Zoom, just oh, like his funny. uncle. Good Lord. He marries Elizabeth, the daughter of a Belgian nobleman. So essentially, they are making their life as well as their name now in the Netherlands. Yeah. When you consider that this Morgan dies in 1642, it's pretty close to Tredegar House starting work in 1664 with all that Dutch influence, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So who knows? Sir Charles Morgan, though, was great. He was often pay his men's wages because he couldn't get people at home to pay for them. He fell between two stools yeah. because they, he, nobody was quite sure whether he should be paid by the Netherlands or by England. Oh, right. So neither tried to pay for him. So basically <laughs> he ended up paying the wages himself and getting into yeah. debt. Yeah. He did get come back to South Wales for a period where he was justice of the peace. And there was a suggestion that this particular Morgan might have had strong Catholic sympathies. Um, because when it comes to recusancy, they made a list and they said, well, your wife is a recusant and possibly a Catholic. And so is your brother and your brother-in-law and your aunt and your. Yeah, so, is. again, a dabble in Catholicism yeah. by the Morgans of Pencarn. Yeah. The history of Catholicism in this part of the world is, in part of South East Wales particularly, is very strong. Yeah. But Sir Charles had all kinds. He was captured by privateers. He had all sorts. And when he died, he was buried uh, in um, Bergen op Zoom. And his grave isn't small. Look at that. Oh, gosh. Oh. You've got Sir Charles here and his wife looking down at him. Yeah. You've got the Morgan crest up here. You got oh, the griffin. Yeah, the, yeah, the griffin, yeah. And over this side, you've got the stag's heads. Yes, yeah. So it's a <laughs> little cherub. Yeah. So this is enormous. And this is in the church in Bergen, op Zoom. Because again, huge, important man. So you can see when they say warriors of Pencarn, that they're brought up by the pike, not with the book. Yeah. yeah. We've had three in a row. Yeah. That are not just warriors, but famous European warriors with knighthoods. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All stemming from that little patch of land close to Tredegar House. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, so what happens to the Morgans of Pencarn is Sir Charles uh, has a, a daughter, Anne, doesn't have a son. And Anne marries Sir Lewis Morgan of Rupera Castle. Oh, oh right. So they kind of go to, to Rupera Castle. Yeah. When he dies, she marries someone else, and her third marriage is a Millbourne of Wanastow. So we talked about him. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's all, uh, it all links. Yeah, wow. Well, they all married into each other, and it's all oligarchy. Now, we can't stop talking about Pencarn without, and maybe you can take this up, Goff, without talking about this chap. <laughs> so what, why, do, why are we talking about him with Pencarn? Well, there's a debate. Eight. It was always believed that Sir, Captain Sir Henry Morgan, the famous privateer. And Captain Pugwash lookalike. And Captain Pugwash lookalike. That's another theory of mine that Captain Pugwash was based upon this drawing. Because if you put the pictures side by side, you can see. I put them up somewhere a couple of years ago. Um, they, they, Henry was all believed to be living to have lived in Clantarnham Hall. Clan uh, Rumney. Clan Rumney Hall, I beg your pardon. Clan Rumney Hall. So that was the, the belief, but the, the problem is it's based upon, um, he had, to, Henry refers to two estates when he's in, uh, at, at, um, at one point, Pencarn and uh, Clan Rumney. And he had these two estates in uh, the West Indies. So he evidently does have it. When he gets into trouble, because he was a privateer, basically he was a sort of pirate that worked on behalf of the British Crown, he got into trouble for the sacking of Panama City because his charter did not allow him to undertake land battles. So uh, Henry was very successful at that, but it was an outcry. So he got summoned back to the country. And uh, one of the Morgans of Tredegar at the time referred to Henry as being a cousin and close neighbour. 
Now, as we know from the maps we've been looking at, the closest neighbour, the closest part is actually Ten Khan, not Plan Rumney Hall, which is a lot further to the east. So it, this is why how our 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 how our, 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 our Henry Morgan gets wrapped into this story. Um, yeah, um, the branch of the of the Morgans of Tredega. None of the money of his privacy got anywhere near Tredega House, despite the fact what people have told often tried to claim. The money never went anywhere there, and um, it's a different group. But yeah, he was. Yeah, that, that's why Henry crops up with Ten Khan. That's right. Um... He does. And yeah, two estates in Jamaica. Um, as you said, you had Lan Rumney, which is the larger one in fairness, and then Penn Khan. Yeah. Now we know his wife was from Lan Rumney. Yeah. So the question well, we're not denying there's, is I think the argument is no there's no denying no, no, no. with Lan Rumney Hall and Lan Rumney, but it depends which one you see as the actual basis of Yeah, race. either way the question is why does he name an estate after Penn Khan. He clearly has a connection yeah. to Penn Khan, yeah. which we don't know about. I mean, was he born at Lan Rumney and then he grew up at Penn Khan? He said that he grew up in a soldierly fashion. Oh, well, that's it. Is, Penn Khan's old body. Penn Khan's which is old very old much body. Penn Khan. So we don't know. I guess we will never know. Um, but Penn Khan has, I think, well, he does have a link with Sir Henry Morgan, as well as all the other extraordinary historical links we've touched on this evening. Yeah. Amazing. And because he had his own theme tune. Dum da dum dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum I tell you what, there is one theme tune. There is one theme tune that um people aren't actually aware of that. It's one for the teenagers, that one, isn't it? For the teenagers, yes. There is a tune called and one of the schools in Pontypool. Uh um a listener will tell me what one that is. Uh certainly back in the day used to teach their pupils Captain Morgan's March. And they came up to me and said, oh, Captain Morgan's March. And a lot of them thought it was Henry Morgan. No, it certainly was not. It was a much older oh. musical composition. The uh, Captain Morgan they referred to was actually Sir Morgan at Meredith. Oh, right. Morgan the yes. Rebel. Yeah, blimey. So Morgan the Rebel has a theme tune and it's still yeah, going. <laughs> which is absolutely amazing. Now, of course, uh, Sir Henry dies in 1688, doesn't he, Goff? And, he, and really, it's um, you can't visit his grave. Shall we put it that way? No, completely destroyed by an earthquake. Yep. Washed into the sea and gone completely. It's yep. very interesting. We, 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 a rosy glow has settled over piracy uh, over the years, and it, it really was a barbaric, hideous trade. <laughs> there's no two ways about it. I remember taking a lady from the West Indies around Tredega House once, and there's a por portrait that I believe to be Henry as a young man of about 16 on the wall. And we, we said, oh, and this is Captain Sir Henry Morgan. And she was appalled. She said, Listen, why <laughs> yeah. have you got that monster on the walls? And it was like, oh, my goodness. Because we just think, ah, a bit of a pirate, a bit of a laugh, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, pirates were not, were not fun. <laughs> Certainly not when you're on the wrong end of it. Oh, in the wrong end of it. Yeah, well, as far as, sorry. Character. Oh, yeah, yeah, incredible character. Um, he, uh, he was addicted to staying up late and drinking heavily. And when he died, his liver went off with a bang they heard in the other room. <laughs> Proud Morgan tradition. Is that the way you're going to go? No, the, at the moment, Goff, the way you're going to go is lying on a bed and it collapsing, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. Falls through three floors below and I wind up in the cellar. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, Henry certainly didn't die at Pencar Northland Rumney. Of course, it was, as Goff said, in Jamaica. It is quite interesting. We do know that in 17, is it 21, 1723, my memory fade, uh, sort of fails me on this point. We do know that there's a marriage settlement for a Henry Morgan of Pencarn, which if nothing else, even though it is not an uncommon name, we do know the Morgans of Pencarn used Henry as a name. Yeah. Just to throw yeah. that in there. Not all branches did. Yeah, I mean, names do come down generations at this period. Yeah, they do. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. In 1783... Remember, this mighty Tredegar estate doesn't own Pencarn right on its doorstep. Oh, it didn't? I was no, to... not until 1783. Oh, so, you know, the Flemings, you've had the Knights Templar, yeah. you've had all of, all of these people, you've had the Morgans of Pencarn. In 1783, John Morgan of Rupera and Tredegar uh, does buy the, uh, I think it was about 40 acres that constituted Pencarn estate or manor at the time for um, 
for five hundred and sixty-one pounds. Oh. So he buys Pen Khan. Yeah. So from that moment on, from seventeen eighty-three on, Pen Khan is sucked into the vast Tradiga estate. Yeah. So in the nineteenth century, it appears to have devolved into those farms that we saw. Yeah. Uh, Great Pen Khan, we don't know this for a fact, but maybe Great Pen Khan was the site of the old manor house, possibly. Uh, hence the great, yeah. uh, possibly. Um, and if so, we know Lord Tredegar's herdsmen lived there in the late 19th century, and then it yeah. became a, a normal farm. And and then, you know, it, it all became uh, just sort of knocked down, well, which is where we are today. In many of the other um, uh, podcasts, great houses do frequently go through you know, a decline of stage and wind up as farmhouses, lived in a portion of it and the rest is a romantic ruin attached to it. I mean, so it's not impossible that that does happen. Well, no. Uh, you, you, don't re you can't know. That was, you know, a speculation. You cannot say anything. You cannot say that's an historical fact, but it's not unlikely. No, we, we can't. There, there, there's certainly... There appears to be... When people say lived at Pencarn, tenement at Pencarn, resident at Pencarn... The word in use for these earlier stories, and uh, that suggests that at some point there must have been a building at Pencarn. Whether all these warrior Morgans of Pencarn yeah. lived there, I mean, who knows? Yeah. They were born there, they were from there, that's certainly true. Now, in 1997, in the search for historical fact, there was a little, there was the Gwent, the Morgan Gwent Archaeological Trust, got here, in 1997, did do an archaeological dig at Great Pencarn Farm. Oh. And, uh, there's only so much you can learn from a from you know from a, a trench, but they found it quite interesting. Um, they found a single Bronze Age post, oh, uh, and they found evidence of a Roman settlement. Yeah, and they believe that the Romans were there. Roman uh, uh, were 150 AD, and then left in 300. Oh well, that's quite a, that's a substantial like, chunk of time. Someone suggested there might have been a Roman villa. Yeah. The suggestion was that what they'd found was an outlying part of a larger farmstead. Yeah. And of course, you then had later stuff, medieval and post medieval bits found there as well. So it has been a site that was lived on for a very long time. That's an absolute fact. Yeah. It has yeah. Roman drainage and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, whether they will, in fact, the true answers to many of these questions and maybe the foundations of, of maybe the old Pencarn house may well lie underneath a housing development yeah yeah or underneath a, a road i mean they road. do they do try when they were building um on the old saint joseph school which was uh it itself was built on the kitchen garden site of tradiga yeah. house, house yeah. they did do an archaeological dig there as much as they could and but what would you find you're basically looking at a kitchen garden aren't you uh, always a garden, but a, but the kitchen garden, and they found a large pipe, which they thought may have been to do with the lake at one point. Oh yeah. But what is interesting, they call that little bunch of houses Pencarn Village. Oh. And so when you see the names, you know Jamaica Grove, they yeah. call it. And I remember when they named it that, and I said to you, "Oh, ridiculous! <laughs> Jamaica Grove and Henry Morgan Way and all of yeah. this." But. Yeah. Who knows if he did have connections, and it seems he did have connections to Penn Khan. We're better for Henry Morgan's name, street names to be than in a little place called Penn Khan Village, not yeah. far from the original site. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not, not inappropriate. It's not as inappropriate as ranty little Paul thought all those years ago. <laughs> His tiny feet drumming on the floor with frustration. You can hear them. <laughs> so there we are. Well, I think that was worthwhile as a little bonus, wasn't it? Yeah, that was very yeah. You're very interested to pull all those threads together, and see and see how it how it all lines up. And it's interesting to see you go you go from, you know, pseudo mythology right the way up to, not mm. pseudo mythology, pseudo history up to, uh, you know, actual. It is like there. catching smoke, though, isn't it, Pencarn? Yeah. Because it is it it's suggested but never confirmed. Yeah. Buildings, the chapel of Saint Gladys. Yeah. We haven't found, nobody's found evidence of a chapel on the site. I mean, if it had gone early, we probably wouldn't find the evidence of a chapel on the site unless you know where to look. No, exactly. So that, I mean, the manor house itself, if there was one, you just don't know. Yeah. Well, there we are. That's sometimes in history, although it's very infuriating, what you don't know is often as intriguing as what you do. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Garth. That's great fun. Thank you very much.
Thank you for having me. I hope your bed gets fixed. Uh, a new bed, I would have. If it's all sticks, a new bed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know what you can do. If anybody's able to come and help me lift the mattress because I can't pick it up with a bad back, I can do uh, you Just, you know, leave a message. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Goff is any bed lifters or mattress lifters do apply to Goff Morgan, Malpas, Newport. Yeah. Uh, dear me. Yeah, but so your your bed at the moment is essentially a bed, bed of sticks, isn't it? You said. So that's unfortunate. Nest of sticks with a mattress on top in a big baggy, saggy way, rather like me. And I flump into it rather gently. You've ever seen the Adams family where Festa Adams jumps onto the bed and just gets sucked into the mattress? It's a bit like that. It's a bit like that episode. So look out for the first Adams family, the Adams family film with um, yeah, uh, Angelica Houston. You'll see exactly what's going on in my boudoir. And we'll leave that so for everyone to <laughs> ponder. We shall leave it on that note. So thank you for joining us. And I hope you join us soon when we will go to probably a mansion. I can't promise it still exists, but I can promise it definitely would have existed the next one we're going to do. So see you soon. Bye-bye.